All right, let's have a prayer, and then we're going to conclude our time in the book of Philippians this morning, and of course, next weekend, as Aaron noted, our significant weekend of ministry with Bill McAlpine. Let's pray. Father, for this incredible moment that's ours to share together in your holy presence, we give you thanks and praise. And it's kind of mind-blowing to ponder that in your wise providence, in your glorious sovereignty, you have thought of this particular moment from a long, long time ago. And it's your heart's desire in your incredible grace to meet with your people, to pour strength and help and hope into our lives. For that, we are so grateful. Our humble prayer would be simply this. Open up our hearts, Holy Spirit, to receive all that the Lord Jesus had for, has for us in these moments. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, can we all agree with this? Our God has an incredible sense of humor. Can we, can we work with that? Not convinced? Not sure? Look around the room. <laughs> Our God made you and he made me. And frankly, we're pretty funny people. Would you not agree? It's a sign of a well-adjusted person when we can look at ourselves and our foibles and just simply laugh about them. And I've got to believe that our Father, who is our creator, who understands our humanity, that he gets a chuckle out of us every now and again as well. For example, think of the last time that you had what at the moment was an exasperating experience of miscommunication with someone. But when the moment had passed and you were able to step back and ponder it again, you couldn't help but chuckle at how the wires got so obviously crossed. Like, for example, in this video clip. <laughs> sure, that's pretty funny stuff. Our miscommunications, I mean, it's just one example of just the innate humor that characterizes us as people. And I'm convinced that our father gets a smile on his face in those moments. Again, you know, the little kid who writes his pastor a letter. Dear pastor, I know that you've said that God loves everybody, but I don't think he's met my sister. <laughs> I'm sure that God gets a little smile on his face at the delightful candor that marks our children. And just in case we're not totally convinced that our God has a delightful sense of humor, ponder some of the critters he's created. How about the platypus? And then there would be next... The anteater, and finally, the camel. Someone has said that a camel is really a horse that was put together by committee. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if there wasn't literally a divine laughter that filled the heavens as the Almighty plunked some of those critters down on planet Earth so many eons ago. Our God most definitely is filled with joy and has a wonderful sense of of humor. In fact, isn't it our God who admonishes us to make a joyful noise unto the Lord? As Swindoll says, why do we always think that means singing? I mean, of course it means singing, but what noise is more joyful than the noise of authentic laughter that fills our hearts and our homes sometimes? That, my friends, is a joyful noise. Jesus, our Lord, he lived the perfect joy of heaven on earth during his incarnation. Is not joy one of the fruit of the Spirit? Of course it is. And so we see in the pages of Scripture and in some of these examples, even of our Lord Jesus Christ, that our Father has a delightful sense of humor. And perhaps one last thing that I think of. Do you recall that contest that Elijah took on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal? And at one point in the contest... Mm, Elijah ramps up the sarcasm just a little bit. And he turns to the prophets of Baal and he says to them, hey, maybe the reason that your God is not answering with fire from heaven is because he's in the bathroom. That's truly in the Bible. That ironic phrase is in Scripture and I can't help but think that our father got a chuckle when Elijah put that one at the prophets of Baal. Yes, Joy and laughter 
matter to God. They're significant to him. And as we have moved our way through this wonderful letter from the Apostle Paul to the followers of Jesus at the Church of Philippi, we've encountered over and over again in this letter the joy of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. And as we conclude this morning, I want to take you to the final verses in this book. It's chapter 4, verses 19 to 23. That's page 1164 in the Church Bibles. And in these verses, Paul highlights three simple truths. That is, we own them in obedience in our lives. We live in some of that very joy that characterizes the Lord our God. First thing I want you to see in the verses is this. In verses 19 and 20, Paul writes about the glory of God's strategy. The glory of God's strategy. Verse 19, he writes, And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. In that 19th verse is the great promise that we talked a little bit about last Sunday. As we choose to honor our God by giving generously to the work of God and to those who serve the gospel of Christ out of what our Lord has blessed us with, and as we choose to give ourselves selflessly to be Jesus' hands and feet, to minister the love of Christ Jesus to the people that the Lord brings into our lives, as we give ourselves to our God in this way, yielding to him generously our time, our talents, our treasures, our God, according to those, that verse, plainly promises to meet our needs. It is flat out a promise, isn't it? And it's a promise by God himself. My God will meet plentifully. He will meet all of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. As we honor our God, make no mistake, in ways that will blow us out of the water, he will honor and bless us. And then when we slide into that 20th verse, when God blesses us, when he moves into our lives and does wonderful things by his mercy and grace for us, it always comes back to him. He always gets the glory. He always gets the credit. And that's really God's strategy. He loves blessing us, and we respond to him with humble praise and gratitude, and he gets the glory. Back in 1866, a gentleman by the name of Alfred Noble invented something quite significant. He invented dynamite. And he would go on to amass, as you would imagine, an incredible fortune, being the individual on the planet to invent dynamite. Then one day, Alfred Nobel had a rather unusual experience. What would you do, for example, if you sat down with your coffee in hand tomorrow morning, you grabbed your copy of the Calgary Herald, and you opened it up, and you read your obituary there? That's what happened to Alfred. He picked up a copy of the local newspaper one day, and days earlier his brother had passed away, and the newspaper had made a mistake. They had greatly exaggerated Alfred's untimely demise. He was still very alive. But as he read his obituary, it was an incredibly interesting, odd, and compelling experience. Because the obituary went on to describe how Alfred Nobel was the inventor of dynamite, the most destructive force known to humanity. And that moment just gripped his heart. It was for him so, comp so compelling. He thought to himself, I actually don't want my name and my family legacy to be destruction and death and carnage. And so he really went back and thought about it. And as he pondered, he knew what he would do. He would take his sizable fortune, he would create an endowment, and he would use that endowment now to acknowledge significant contributions to humanity in the sciences and in the humanities. And when Alfred Nobel passed away on December the 10th, 1896, it was discovered that he had left millions upon millions of dollars aside that would be used now for Nobel Prizes, one of them being the Nobel Peace Prize. Because in his last days, as Alfred communicated to those close to him, he wanted his legacy to be one of peace and not of destruction. I want to say it again. What would we want to read if we had the opportunity to do so in our obituary? What would we want our legacy to be? How about this? He or she 
had yielded their life in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in humble dependence upon the Spirit of God, this person sought to live out their faith 24-7. They sought to live their life as a glory to the living God. My friends, as we choose, even as Paul admonishes in these verses, to live such that God gets the glory and the praise in our lives, make no mistake, that's where joy is. So what does that mean for us? When your boss comes into your office one morning and with a smile on his or her face acknowledges that you've just received a promotion, well, in that moment, are you happy? Of course you are. And you worked hard for that promotion. But in the next breath, it's all about God. You get the glory. You've given me the health and strength, Father, the ability to do my job. You've given me the talents and the skills that I have so that I've been able to do it in a manner that's marked by success. So, Father, you get the credit. You get the glory. What about those moments when we have a need or someone we know has a need, someone close to us, a spiritual need, an emotional need, a physical need, and believing that Jesus is all we need, we cast our hope upon him, and the Lord Jesus moves in, and in a place of incredible anxiety and fear, he ministers his peace. Or where there's a need for freedom and to be drawn deep into the heart of the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God just so wonderfully performs that. Or the Lord Jesus steps in and does a healing miracle of his grace. In that moment, because we can, we must, we give God the credit and the glory. And we don't just do it from ourselves to God. Of course we do that. But every chance we get when we talk to people, we say, oh, yeah, our God did that. It's not because of anything that I deserve. It's because he is filled with mercy and love and compassion. And I just get to be on the receiving end. And he gets all the credit and the glory. And when we have an opportunity for MOI to be Jesus' hands and feet, coming alongside someone to demonstrate and declare the hope and love that's found in Christ Jesus. Oh, how much joy we experience in that moment as God does his thing through us. And when all said and done again, our God gets the glory. He gets the credit. And as we lean into the Spirit of God for strength to live that way, even as Scripture admonishes us right near the end of this letter on joy, make no mistakes. Our lives will be filled with joy. So that's the first thing Paul says by way of closing. He talks about the glory of God's strategy, and then he talks about the greeting of God's saints. Verses 21 and 22, Paul writes, Greet all the saints in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me send greetings. All the saints send greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. It's that phrase, Caesar's household, that's pretty intriguing. What exactly does that mean? The common assumption is that contained within those two words, Caesar's household, would be slaves and former slaves of the emperor. Also would be included would be government officials, civic officials, including some very high-ranking government officials in the emperor's government. Included in those words, Caesar's household, would also be some of the emperor's own blood relationships. Do you see what Paul is acknowledging here? He is acknowledging that the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead to pay for people's sins everywhere, and that this truth becomes so real and life-transforming in our lives when we simply receive it by faith, that message was preached right through Caesar's household. In fact, legend would even tell us that on one occasion when the emperor at the time, who happened to be Nero, when Nero was out of town, Nero's wife came under the teaching of the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and she yielded her heart in faith to Christ. And as the legend goes on to say, when Nero returned home and learned of his wife's decision to follow Jesus, his heart was filled with an anger that knew no bounds. And perhaps it was, it was in that moment and in that rage that he impetuously acted and ended the life of the Apostle Paul. We don't know that for sure. But what we do know for certain 
is that the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus, the gospel of Christ Jesus, was being spoken into the very upper echelons of first century Roman government. In that bastion of arrogance and unbelief, the name of Jesus was being proclaimed, and the most powerful person on the face of the earth was utterly powerless to do anything about it. Now, don't you think that put a smile on the faces of the early believers? Don't you think that brought some joy and a little laughter to their hearts? Oh, yes, yeah, Caesar, take that. Someone says, well, that's cool, that's awesome, but that was Paul, and that was then, and here's you and me, and this is now. What difference does it make to us? Let's talk a little bit about our hands, and I've got some props here. You want to toss me that football there, Aaron? Now that I've only got one hand, okay, there we go. So uh, football, a football in my hand, well, we can play a little catch with it. We can throw it back and forth, but it's not much more than that. It's just a football in my hand, but you take this football now, and you put this football in Russell Wilson's hands, and you've got a Super Bowl champion. It all depends on whose hand it's in, tennis racket. I'm a hack tennis player, not very good at the game at all. My Australian brother and sister here, they're, uh, they're tennis players. Not me, but I can hit the tennis ball around a little bit. So uh, a tennis racket in my hand, eh, it is what it is. It's just kind of a recreational game. But you put a tennis racket in the hands of Serena Williams, and that tennis racket wins a phenomenal 37 major championships. It just depends on whose hand it's in. Hockey stick. In my hands, the hockey stick's worth about 50 bucks. You put this hockey stick into the hands of the golden kid, Sid the kid, that hockey stick is worth $10 million. It all depends on whose hand it's in. So here's the deal. Before we leave church this morning, may I challenge you, may I encourage you to do this? Confess, first of all, before your God that you absolutely believe the truth of his word, that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. Then also tell your God that you counted an incredible privilege and a high calling to be able to be on mission with the Lord Jesus for maximum outward impact. Sharing that message, the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ with the people that he brings into your life. And then put your hand in God's hand and get ready to smile. Because it really depends upon whose hand it's in. Think about the Apostle Paul. Think about the gospel going right before Caesar himself. Who knows? Who knows what God does through us to bring glory to his name and his blessing into the lives of people when we simply choose to put our hand in his hand. One final truth. In verse 23, we see the grace of God's Son. Paul writes, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And with that 23rd verse, Paul wraps up the scroll. He hands it to Epaphroditus. I envision the two men exchanging a hug. And then Epaphroditus makes his way back to Philippi. And this side of heaven, those two men will never see each other again. It's no wonder that as Paul concludes the letter, he returns to the theme of grace. Think about the life of the Apostle Paul. At one time in his life, he was actively opposing the church of Jesus Christ. He was pushing back hard. He was there cheering everybody on when they put the follower of Jesus, Stephen, to death. And then one day on the road to Damascus, God, in his unmerited favor, in his grace, God reached down and grabbed a hold of the apostle Paul and called him to himself. Not only that, the Lord Jesus, by his grace, forgave Paul all of his sins, gave him a brand new start, robed him in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus, and that to the very extent that later in his life, Paul would say, all of my personal endeavors, all of my strivings, all of the things that I thought was pretty hot stuff in the end is absolutely zero compared to knowing Christ Jesus and living in his righteousness by the grace of God. And then, of course, it would be the grace of God that would call the Apostle Paul 
a Jewish rabbi, to take the very message of the Lord Jesus to the entire Gentile world. And it was this grace of God that would keep Paul right into all eternity. That same grace of God is in operation in our world and in our lives, and not a few of us here this morning have had our sins forgiven, and we've been brought into a personal friendship with the living God, and he has fitted us for all eternity in his presence, and all of that by the grace of God, nothing deserved here, all of it by the grace of God made so real to us in Christ Jesus. If that doesn't put a smile on our face, then what does? Let's watch one little video segment here, and with that, we are just about... So let me get this straight. We get to live for the glory of the living God. We get to be on mission with the Lord Jesus Christ. And by his grace in Christ Jesus, he has called us to himself for time and for eternity. My friends, if that doesn't put a smile on our face and joy in our hearts and laughter in our lips, then nothing else will. To God be the glory. Let's pray.